Welcome to the Sports Playbook, where we discuss solutions to issues that impact sports. I'm your host, Angela Hazlett. Today's guest is Mike Orvos, the Event Security Manager for AMB Sports and Entertainment at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium in Atlanta, Georgia. We are here to discuss professional stadium security, making sports facilities safe. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Happy to be here. It's really good to see you. And I know that um, A&B Sports and Entertainment, they operate the Mercedes-Benz Stadium, which opened in August of 2017. The Mercedes-Benz Stadium is a world-class sports and entertainment venue in downtown Atlanta, home to the National Football League's Atlanta Falcons and the Major League Soccer's um, Atlanta United. So, Michael, what are some of the security challenges in operating a professional stadium in an urban location? Yeah, so especially here having two kind of anchor tenants, like you said, with uh, soccer and football and then countless of kind of other things, whether it's concerts, um, private special events, trade shows, conventions, that kind of thing. We just have a lot of uh, different events that we put on here, which always keeps us on our toes, uh, keeps things interesting. But as far as being in an urban setting, um, you know, we rely on our city partners, whether it's uh, local law enforcement, Atlanta police, um, Fulton County here, uh, the, you know, the, the county that our city is in, um, up to our federal partners, whether it's the FBI, Homeland Security, constantly working with them on, you know, anything that they hear as far as intelligence, um, and as well as just kind of, you know, the general things of being in an urban setting, right? So if you're at MetLife Stadium in New York or what they have in Philly where they're surrounded by parking lots versus what we have where, you know, we're right downtown bordering on, um, you know, the complex kind of have where we've got the basketball arena next door, uh, Georgia World Congress Center, which hosts, you know, tons of huge conventions and kind of other trade shows. So we rely on a lot of like walk up traffic from local hotels or public transportation uh, using MARTA, you know, the you know, local train system here in the city. So, you know, we just kind of have to work with those partners a lot more, I think, than uh, what you would in, in more of like a suburban uh setting where you're just relying on, you know, your fans coming in, parking their cars, uh, just a lot of like maintain that, that communication and those relationships. So you can really, you know, be able to, um, you know, successfully coordinate things, make sure everyone's on the same page and, and nail down kind of the aspects of your game day and, and your event day and what we'll make those unique. So that's interesting that you might have to, if there's some kind of incident that happens, you might have to coordinate and communicate with those other um, uh, facilities and let them know what's going on and vice versa. Um, so your plans can be impacted by what's happening in those adjacent locations. Um, are there any particular events that you host at the Mercedes-Benz Stadium that present unique security challenges? Yeah, I mean, anytime we have, um, you know, an event, kind of a mega event, if you will, right? So we've had the college football playoff, Super Bowl. Um, we were supposed to do the Final Four in 2020 until that got canceled last minute. Uh, but anytime you have an event where, you know, you're on national television, um, we do the SEC Championship game here every year. Uh, Chick-fil-A Peach Bowl is, is going to be a college football game, playoff game, a semifinal in 2022. So a lot of those events, you're working with even more partners, right? So, you know, for the SEC Championship, we're working with, obviously, the Southeastern Conference, um, CBS for broadcasting. So it kind of just widens your group, widens the amount of stakeholders, and just really um, compounds the importance of having those relationships having you know, the good communication with the you know groups that you work with year after year, um, like we do with the SEC and, and you know the one-offs, what, whether it's Super Bowl or Final Four, um, they use Populous as kind of their event management uh, group. Um, you know, Populous has done this every Super Bowl since I think like the late 70s. Uh, they do the Olympics, they do the World Cup. So they, you know, are the the people that kind of are the event managers for the for those big uh, groups. So you just kind of um, open up your building to them, see kind of how you can be of, of service. And, and obviously with those events too, you have all of the ancillary events, right? So you've got fan festivals, um, concerts, hospitality packages. So it's really just, you know, taking in everything that you have to, everything that you have for the event and then what goes on around the event. And then um, security wise, it's, you know, how do we staff this from, you know, a guest services, event security perspective, 
um, what kind of help do we need from our uh, local and state federal law enforcement partners to make sure that we have a good event, um, making sure that if there's any kind of like VIPs, celebrities, politicians, dignitaries that you're meeting with their security teams, doing advances, uh, monitoring their movements, supporting them with, you know, staff or either, even just information. It's just a lot of, um, you know, small details that go into those major events. And, and it's pretty cool to see how it all comes together um, from, you know, operational side, you know, you just at home, turn on the TV and, and watch the game, but there's so much more that goes into it uh, in the weeks, months, and even, you know, years for those major events coming into it. I mean, we, we had meetings about the final four in, I think, you know, August of 2019 is when we started, or it's August of 2018 is when they really started ramping up. So, you know, 18 months in advance for stuff like that. And there's a lot of, it's interesting. I think you're talking a lot about these non-routine events. You have these routine events with your Atlanta Falcons and Atlanta United that you sort of anticipate and know what to expect about these non-routine or um, infrequent irregular events probably require a lot more planning and communication that, that changes the, the level Absolutely. of difficulty. Um, it, I, I'm interested in the, the design of the facility. I think it's a really beautiful facility, the Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Um, one thing to note is the 360-degree kind of open concourse that you have. And I'm curious if you perceive that to be a security challenge or an, a, a benefit to managing the people in the stadium. Yeah, I think it's a benefit to um, just having, you know, the crowd flow um, either, you know, coming in through ingress or leaving through egress. And then obviously there's, you know, your areas of the concourse that are going to be closer to the gates are going to have more traffic than the ones that are on the opposite side of the stadium, say. So, you know, that's all stuff that we've been able to recognize over the years that we've been open here and, and adjust accordingly. But overall, I think just having that free flow of people is really important um, as, as well as having like the wide concourses we do here. Well, I've seen some other facilities, you have very narrow kind of choke points, or like you said, you have, you know, some concourses that don't go all the way around the stadium. I was just at a, a pretty new hockey arena um, in early March where the, the top concourse didn't go all the way around and being a first time visitor, you know, you don't know that it's just kind of a throws you a wrench or you might not be as, familiar with it, obviously, like the season ticket holders to figure it out, but you're always going to have your first time visitors, your unique visitors that come in for, you know, concerts or um, could be, you know, Disney on ice type shows for a place like that. Um, but overall, I think security wise, it's fine. And then I think the biggest difference it makes is for the fan experience, um, you know, just the different kind of like activations and, and bars that we have around here on the concourses. And then one of the cooler things I thought they did was, uh, the 100 yard club up on the 300 level. Um, so basically the entire South side of the 300 level is, um, you know, Falcons branded. It's got, you know, the full 100 yard football field uh, pattern on the ground. And then you've got all kinds of different like neighborhood bars, concession stands. Um, it's got columns that kind of uh, have information about, you know, the Falcons legends, legendary coaches, players, stuff like that. I think it's really cool because a lot of NFL stadiums, the 300 level is just kind of like forgotten about. It's kind of just the wild west where, you know, you're just trying to pack in as many fans as possible. Um, not really a lot of thought is given to, you know, the feel or the, the hospitality, um, hospitality angle of it. And I think that's something that we did really hear where it's just, you know, smaller steps, but it really adds that premium feel uh, to our upper levels that you don't get in a lot of stadiums. Wow, that sounds really interesting. And, and so that was really well thought out, um, mm -hmm. a part of the design to create, enhance a, a better experience on that level. Um, well, let's, let's shift our conversation just a little bit and talk about the COVID-19 pandemic because it's um, certainly something that's impacted professional sports um, starting back in March of 2020. Um, really, the NFL was at the forefront of establishing some COVID protocols, um, including closing facilities to most employees, including athletes. Um, June of 2020, the league issued some reopening protocols, which included controlling facility access, cleaning, disinfecting, physical distancing. Um, so your organization eventually was able to schedule some games without fans and eventually return to 
operations to a full stadium capacity. And I know the impact was great, losing millions of dollars in anticipated revenues in those early days. Mm -hmm. Um, And your organization even went so far as to establish a million dollar emergency relief fund for those core employees who experienced hardship during the the pandemic. So tell me, um, from your perspective, what was it like to implement COVID mitigation procedures with everything just constantly in flux and changing and trying to provide the safest but best experience possible? (laughs) Yeah, it was definitely interesting. Um, just the how, just how like fast things moved, and then how fast things changed too. So it it constantly felt like you were trying to shoot at a moving target, and you didn't know how fast the target was moving and where it was headed next. Um, so you know, w- once we got through that initial, you know, what's going on here? How do we need to react? Uh, obviously, you know, you rely on your league guidelines. So MLS and NFL went to the tier system of, you know, tier one was essentially players, coaches, trainers. Tier two was people who may have some contact with tier one folks. And then tier three is completely separate. So most of our staff um, outside of, you know, the facility folks, team operations, uh, team security fell into that tier three category. So we weren't necessarily uh, subject to the testing requirements being here at the stadium. You know, the players are spend the vast majority of their time at the team facilities. They're not uh, here at the stadium except for match day. So we weren't really subject to that. But it was interesting just to see, you know, when it went to an event day, you know, we switched up a lot of things, switched up, um, you know, where our visiting team locker room was so that we were able to kind of like cordon off one corner of the stadium um, to be, you know, the, the team and player side and, and keep that very separate. Um all of the different like physical barriers we built. I'm sure it was a great time for the, the plexiglass industry <laughs> really well that year, uh, just because of all the, you know, different kind of, of barriers people were making. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we had walls, you know, par- partitions, uh, whether it was in the locker room or uh, out on the, the service level hallway to, to keep, you know, players and, and fans separate. So it was definitely a, an interesting time. Um, I will say being in Georgia, we didn't have a lot of the um, mitigation steps or, you know, governmental legislation type things that they did in, in some of the northern states where, you know, we did uh, temperature screening and stuff and, and kind of a health questionnaire for associates um, of the stadium. But we, you know, all of our fan facing stuff, you know, we didn't have to do um vaccination requirements or health screening or anything for the fans themselves. So I know that added a lot of like staff and a lot of hurdles for, uh, you know, stadiums and venues in, you know, New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, but that was something that we didn't have to do here. And then I think we did a good job of, of kind of being able to scale our operation to, you know, whether, like you said, it was, uh, matches with no fans, which is very eerie to watch. Um, just you know, a soccer match with you know twenty people watching, um, or we went to you know twenty five percent capacity. I think at the SEC we were at about thirty percent capacity for twenty twenty, um, and then you know as we ramped up to going half up to you know now that we're back to full capacity, which it was really cool. I will say um, last year at the SEC championship game. But like walking on the field, that was our, we've been back to like full capacity, but as far as like actually, you know, getting every seat in the stadium filled, that was one of our first events where we really had that. And it was just like, like, you know, that was one of those moments where you're like, all right, this is, this is pretty neat. This is, you know, what we, we suffered through all of those, um, like I said, kind of awkward, awkward days on certain times. Um, and then to be able to ramp up to that and see a full stadium like that was pretty special. And, and that's why you're there, right? To Absolutely, yeah. That, that was an experience. So, um, and it's interesting you talked about Georgia not having some of the same restrictions that other states and communities had. What about um, between the NFL protocols, MLS protocols, um, were there any distinctions or challenges that was anything different that where you had to treat different events and different um, staff differently? Did you have to run things differently, I guess, based on what event you were holding and how did you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they, they both had tier systems. So it was kind of similar in terms of, you know, keeping the groups 
um, separate and, and being able to implement, you know, contact tracing strategies, stuff like that. Um, but obviously, you know, just logistically, you have 53 plus players plus the practice squad players on a football team and only about 20 on the soccer team. So, you know, your logistics as far as um, getting them in the stadium off the bus um, through our screening, stuff like that, to, um, you know, post-game meals uh, going to, to take away. But obviously, you know, logistically setting up a post-game meal area for, you know, 100 players and staff is a lot differently for a soccer team. So there's just a lot of different nuances, a lot of different um, kind of curveballs we had to react to in order to set those up um, and, you know, going to, you know, NFL had one testing policy as far as like days of the week versus MLS was different versus college football is a whole different thing because obviously, you know, them being NCAA student athletes under different rules. Um, we didn't have to deal with that as much as they did at the facilities, but it was just interesting to see, like you said, all of the differences between the leagues and, and kind of how they managed it and were able to, you know, still get their seasons in um, during the pandemic. Absolutely. Absolutely. And so a lot of those um, protocols seem to still be in place as far as hand sanitizing stations, mm -hmm. increased cleaning, the contactless guest experiences. Um, so I, it sounds like a lot of those maybe are here to stay at least for a little, a little while. Um, let's talk about some of the other policies you have regarding when fans are coming to the stadiums, they're prohibited from bringing certain things into the stadium, like loose batteries, bottles, laptops, inflated balls, drones, noisemakers, weapons, and additionally, only clear bags are permitted into the stadium. So when patrons come in, um, I understand you have a screening process called the Evolve Express Stadium Entry Technology. So it's interesting because this technology allows patrons to come through the screening process without having to actually empty their bags. They can just carry their bags through the screening technology. So that's really interesting. So what is the purpose of have continuing to have clear bags if we no longer, if patrons no longer have to um, be subject to a physical inspection of their bags? Yeah, well, um, first to kind of piggyback off a point from the last uh, question, um, as far as, uh, you know, the, the things from code mitigation that might be here to stay, right? So I think in a lot of uh, venues, they've maybe not had the same level of, of cleaning uh, techniques and, and, you know, the amount of staff that they threw at that, I think people kind of ended up realizing that maybe that wasn't as beneficial, but I think it really um, accelerated, like you said, the contactless guest experience and how can we take this from a pandemic situation to just something that just makes, you know, lines quicker, less weight, just a better overall thing experience. So a few things that we've done, obviously the Evolve, which I'll touch on in a moment, but we went completely cashless as a stadium. Um, so, you know, we can have people, um, obviously it's a lot quicker from a point of sale perspective if they're just using their cards um, versus cash. And then we also offer like the cash to card machines where they could essentially get uh, a form of a debit card to use. Um, at concession stands or at retail shops. And then with the Evolves too, um, really a game changer uh, that I, you know, wasn't, um, I, you know, I didn't know all the technology when they're bringing it on site. Um, I was over in our same operations department. So I was more focused on the, you know, supporting the logistical side of, you know, how do we power these things up? How do we make sure they work? Um, but now that I've been over on the security side and, and really seen what they can do, I mean, it's a complete game changer. Um, you know, I know, uh, like you said, with, with bags and stuff, but the ability, you know, to the, the throughput that you can get with them as far as, you know, how many people per hour um, is so much faster than the old school kind of walk through metal injectors that you are used to at a lot of um, sports venues and, and airports and stuff like that. As far as the technology and what it's zeroed down to, um, as far as clear bags, a lot of that stuff comes from, uh, NFL best practices that, you know, we have to follow as an NFL facility. So they obviously have to kind of paint a broad brush there because not every uh, venue has switched over to um, the Evolve type technology. There's a couple other, uh, Chea has like the open gate system. Um, the, the technology that, it, that 
makes you able to have that faster throughput. But it's all about uh, kind of you know risk mitigation, looking at uh, you know, obviously you know uh, incidences in the past, whether it was the you know terrorist attack on the soccer stadium in France, and I think 2017 or the 2018 uh, Manchester bombing at the Ariana Grande concert. Um, you know, putting in best practices to stop those kinds of events from happening, right? So you know, making it easy for the guests to get through with their bag, but also being able to have that level of detection for prohibited items uh, that satisfies the, the safety and security element as well. So kind of finding that, that balance and also being able to, to maintain the level of security that's necessary. You have to really be aware of what incidents are happening in other venues, as mm -hmm. well as the technology that can support um, deterring those incidents as well. I mean, one Absolutely. thing that's really... One thing that's really common in stadiums um, is problems with alcohol consumption and or over over consumption. And um, so I know you allow tailgating uh, to happen prior to games. And um, once in the stadium, you're trying to kind of manage and, and control the consumption of alcohol by reducing the amount of sales and, and cutting people off before game games are over. Um, but you know, there was a video actually that was posted on Twitter in December of 2021, where a fight broke out between spectators. Now, I know this isn't really something novel to your specific facility, but um, what do you do when you're talking about consumption of alcohol and controlling the fans um, and the way that they're engaging inside your facility? Yeah, I think uh, the first big thing is, is just training um, and education. So, you know, all of our staff, whether it's event security, guest services, you know, our, our bartenders are going to go through uh, some semblance of, you know, alcohol training, whether it's, you know, recognizing the, the symptoms of impairment, um, you know, how to handle those situations. Uh, obviously, you know, each person is going to be a little bit different. You know, the person who's responding to an altercation like you detailed is going to have different training than the person who's working as a bartender. Um, making sure that your staff is trained and educated on how to handle those situations. Um, you know, something we do is, is limiting uh, the amount of, you know, alcohol you can purchase in one transaction and no one's allowed to purchase more than two per transaction, uh, stuff like that. A lot of different mitigation techniques that they can use. And then, you know, unfortunately we do have the occurrences when, uh, you know, people go too far, get in arguments that may result in physical altercations. And then it's all about, you know, responding to those altercations, um, limiting any kind of, uh, you know, escalation that it might have, and then uh, dealing with those as they come along with uh, our event security and um, law enforcement that we would have at the stadium. Yeah, absolutely. So they might be ejected from the game or absolutely. possibly even arrested, might be banned from the facility even future mm -hmm. events. Um, I thought it was really interesting that, that you have, um, in conjunction with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, a, a pledge for um, people uh, where there's uh, prizes potentially that they can get if they pledge to come um, go home safely and, and be responsible, I guess, um, following the consumption of alcohol. So that, that was really a very creative strategy to encourage people to behave responsibly. Um, your stadium can hold over 70,000 spectators. I know one issue is about people um, getting separated from one another. Um, this can be a concern, particularly when we're talking about missing kids or just other lost patrons. So tell us about your tag a kid program and other ways that you reunify lost persons. Yeah, so uh, primarily handle that through our guest services. Um, we have you know stations all around the stadium where if an occurrence like that does happen, uh, they can go to one of the kiosks. Um, you know we'll kind of put the word out among our staff, and um, they can go that way as far as you know being reunited with their family member. Um, you know we have uh, CCTV cameras are all around where once we can get you know information, we can do everything we can to to reunite them. And you know luckily so far that program has has worked pretty well. You've mentioned um, 
other incidents that might be more extreme? You, you mentioned some like a terrorist incident that could happen in the stadium. So there's always these concerns. I know you have an app that fans can download to use on their phones to receive alerts and notifications. Do you actually use that app to communicate any kind of emergency situations to your patrons? Yeah, so we have a few different ways you can use. Um, you know, both of our teams have an app and the stadium has an app, so you can go that way. Um, we also have an emergency management notification system um, in the stadium. So, you know, we can do the, the canned messages over the, um, you know, our Halo board, all of our ribbon boards, that kind of thing. We also can use the PA system if there's anything in particular that, you know, specific that needs to be addressed in the situation. So we have a, a variety of ways that we can um, keep in touch with our, our fans and, and, and our, you know, plans to, to make sure that they're safe and secure in, in every situation. And I thought it was pretty progressive that you actually are communicating with your fans about the possibility of the need to evacuate the facility to include a video that you posted um, recording procedures on, depending on where you're seated within the mm -hmm. facility, what way you should evacuate the, the stadium. Um, do you find that patrons are actually familiarizing themselves with that information um, or is it just another tool in the toolbox? Um, a little bit of both. I think it just, you know, it's going to tell the person, some people who, you know, depending on the line of work that they're in might be more uh, prone to paying attention to that stuff. And you're going to have some people who are just, you know, there to focus on the game and that's it. So I think the, the most important thing is, is, you know, stressing the importance of, you know, the, old, if you see something, say something slogan, um, making sure that, you know, everyone kind of knows what their job is in the grand scheme of security in the building. And then making sure that, you know, all of our event security staff and guest services folks are trained in what the protocols are in the event of a emergency or an incident where, you know, we would need to evacuate that they know how to get fans out safely and securely. <laughs> So there's a, there's a lot for you to think about. We've only touched on a few different things, but if you could um, like identify any particular um, procedures or protocols or incidents that concern you or maybe keep you up at night, what would you say that um, you're really trying to do to keep people safe within the Mercedes-Benz Stadium? Um, you know, I think we have a, like I said, we, we try to, you know, get ahead of, of all our, um, you know, possible occurrences, try to think through scenarios. We do a really good job of, you know, probably once a quarter, um, we'll sit through tabletop scenarios with, you know, our, um, all the different departments around the building, our, you know, law enforcement partners and kind of go through different scenarios to, to stay ahead of things. And I think we really do a good job of that, um, rehearsing things, going through scenarios, uh, talking through what everyone's role is going to be to, to try and, you know, go through everything that would happen in the event um, of an incident or emergency, and then just make sure, you know, it, it, it all just goes back to, to good training, good education, um, making sure everyone knows what their role is, good communication, and, and, and just try to stay ahead of everything. And, you know, we've all been around the, the industry for a while. We've seen kind of the, you know, the standard, like you said, um, could be, you know, alcohol impairment, um, could be, you know, fans getting in arguments, altercations, that kind of thing, to know how to deal with those and, and just use that experience and, and try to stay ahead of, of anything that comes up. Absolutely. I think the theme here is communication and preparation. <laughs> so with all, with all parties. Yeah, and it like, yeah, it seems like you're doing a great job of that. So um, thanks, Mike, for your insight into professional stadium security and making sports facilities safe. Thank you to our viewers for joining us today on the Sports Playbook. In two weeks, our guest is AJ Monette, who will discuss Tough Mudder's extreme running events. We will see you then.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.